Imagine you're calculating the speed of a runner by dividing the distance they cover by the time it takes them to run. For example, if the race is 100 meters long and the time taken is 10 seconds, the speed is straightforward. 100 divided by 10, or 10 meters per second. Simple, right? But now, what if we focus not on the entire race, but on a tiny segment of it? Suppose we look at a shorter and shorter distance, say, 0.0001 meters. The time interval shrinks along with the distance. As both the distance and the time get smaller and smaller, what happens to the runner's speed? This question isn't as straightforward. It's like asking what happens when both the numerator, or distance, and denominator, or time, of a fraction approaches zero. At first glance, it seems confusing. How can we divide zero by zero and get a meaningful answer? Yet, this is exactly the kind of question limits can help us answer. And here's the amazing part. The result of this process gives us the instantaneous speed of the runner at a specific point in time. Instantaneous speed is different from average speed because it tells us how fast the runner is moving at a single precise moment. It's like zooming in infinitely close to their motion to capture their exact speed at that instant. This concept is the foundation of calculus. It helps us understand change in motion, growth, decay, essentially anything that happens moment by moment. In my previous videos on derivative and integral, link is in the description, I explained how a derivative tells us how fast something is changing at a specific moment, while an integral helps us calculate the total accumulation of something, like area under a curve. You can check them out, but only after completing this video. Both of these concepts rely on limits. Now, apart from zero over zero, there are six other indeterminate forms where limits step in to resolve ambiguity. Infinity over infinity. This happens when both the numerator and denominator of a fraction grow infinitely large. Then, zero times infinity. For example, in physics, imagine a tiny mass accelerating infinitely fast. Does the product result in something meaningful? Then infinity minus infinity. You might think subtracting two infinities should cancel out, but it's not so simple. For instance, consider the natural log of x and square root of x as x approaches infinity. Both of them head to infinity, but at different rates. Then we have 1 raised to infinity. This arises in exponential functions, like compound interest or population growth. The result isn't always one. Limits help determine whether the expression grows, shrinks, or settles to a specific value. Next up, we have zero raised to zero. You might think zero raised to any power is zero, and anything raised to zero is one. But when both the base and the exponent approach zero, the result isn't clear-cut. Lastly, we have infinity raised to zero. Indeterminate forms arise because two opposing trends compete. It's like a mathematical tug-of-war. One side grows, the other shrinks, and limits help us figure out the outcome. So, if you want to find out why they are indeterminate, consider this form, infinity over infinity. If I assume the numerator to be 10 raised to 300, I know it's not infinite, but it is a very large value which, for visualization purposes, we call it infinite, and the denominator to be 10 raised to 100, which is again a very large number. So the ratio will be 10 raised to 200, right, which shows that infinite over infinite can be infinite. Now, if the denominator becomes 10 raised to the power of 1,000, then the ratio will be 10 raised to the power of minus 700, which is 0 0.699 times 0, and then 1, which is almost 0. And finally, if the denominator becomes 10 raised to 299, then the ratio will be 10 raised to 1, which is 10, 
which is a finite value. That is why infinity over infinity is indeterminate, because it can be zero, or infinity, or any other finite value. By the way, suppose we want to find the value of x squared as x approaches 2. This is the way we write it. This lime stands for limit, and this arrow tells us that x is not equal to 2, but it approaches 2. So this is why limits are at the heart of calculus. They let us tackle the infinite, the infinitesimal, and everything in between. Suppose we are asked to find the value of the expression x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2 as x approaches 2. First, let us substitute 2 into the expression. The numerator becomes 2 squared minus 4, which is 4 minus 4, or 0. The denominator becomes 2 minus 2, which is also 0. So the result is 0 divided by 0. This is an indeterminate form, meaning we cannot directly determine the value without further analysis. To resolve this, notice that the numerator, x squared minus 4, is a difference of squares. We can factorize it as x plus 2 times x minus 2. Oh, look, we can cancel out the common term x minus 2 in the numerator and denominator, leaving just x plus 2. This simplification is valid because we are analyzing the behavior of the function as x approaches 2, not when x is exactly equal to 2. Now substitute 2 into the simplified expression x plus 2. This gives 2 plus 2, which equals 4. Therefore, the limit of the given expression as x approaches 2 is 4. This is how we solve a problem in limits. If you want more problems on limits, then comment MLP. And if this video gets 5,000 likes, then I'll create another video where we'll dive deeper into these concepts. So good!